is a joy to be with you this morning. My name is Pastor Pete. If we have not met before, hi, it is nice to meet you. You know, before we jump into our sermon for today, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge what's going around in our world. And so there's a lot of news going around uh, in our country around this election year, and there's been a lot of division, a lot of hurt, a lot of hate. Uh, and we just want to acknowledge what's going on. Uh, and we want to just take a time to say that in the Old Testament, God's talking to Israel, and in 2 Chronicles 7, he says, If my people who are called by my name will turn back to me, humble themselves, prostrate themselves before me, make me the center, then I will forgive them and I will heal their land. And so ultimately, we know that the solution for our society is King Jesus. He is the only solution that works, and when all people, individuals, are looking at him, for their identity and their status as loved children of God, then the whole world prospers. And so we need to look to King Jesus. But second of all, the Bible does tell us and instructs the leaders of the church and Timothy to pray for the leaders of the country. And the reason we pray is not for an agenda, but so that we can live peaceable lives. That's the, that's the thrusting heart behind why we're supposed to pray for our leaders. And so I'm going to take a moment right now, uh, and we're going to pray for our leaders, for our country, that we would see more people know King Jesus, and we'd see the country led in a way that creates peace for all. Okay, so if you guys want to join in, feel free to raise your hand uh, towards and join in in your, in your heart. Okay, so let's pray. Father God, we come before you and we acknowledge you, acknowledge you as the king and the ruler of all things. You are the sovereign Lord and your will is done. And Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come in this earth as it's done in heaven. We pray that Jesus would be made more and more of here in our country and in our land. And that we as your people, the people of your church, the people who call Jesus our Lord and Savior, that we would turn our faces to him. And we would tell all the people in our lives, our neighbors, to look to King Jesus. Um, God, we do pray for our leaders. We pray for all the American political leaders. We pray for our state leaders, our city leaders. We pray for our, our, the leaders of our country, God. Um, we just pray that ultimately they would be able to lead our country in a way that creates peace for all. They would create an environment where people would feel the freedom to pursue King Jesus and to bring Jesus into their neighborhoods, into their communities, into their families. Uh, and that we would be able to lead peaceable lives. Um, God, you can do this, and so we pray. We pray to that end. Please help our leaders. Please help us to have peace in our lands. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, church, uh, we are currently in our series, Authentic Faith, where we've been going through the book of Colossians verse by verse. And the whole point of this series is that we could practically look out what it means to follow Jesus in our everyday lives. What does authentic faith with him look like? Even over the last couple weeks, you know, we've been going over some very practical topics like marriage and then parenting. And so today we're going to continue that trend and we're going to tackle another practical topic. And that's going to be the topic of work. And so the question I want to answer today is how does faith in Jesus change how we view our work, uh, including our daily grind. And my hope today is that whoever you are, uh, wherever you work, and whatever type of work you do, that you would leave here today believing that your work is meaningful and has eternal significance and importance. And so I'm, you can never have enough prayer, so I'm going to pray to that end, and then we'll jump into our text for today. So pray with me, church. Uh, Father God, we just pray that you be with us now as we engage uh, your word, God, as we are reading and learning from what you have written down, God. We just pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us right now, that he would encourage us, that he would equip us, that he would allow us to experience you in a way that changes and transforms our heart and changes the way we live and even the way we work, that we would be people who work to your glory uh, and to your uh, kingdom here in this earth, God. And so we love you. Be with us. Be for us today. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So uh, raise your hands. Who, who knows about Aesop's fables? Who's heard of Aesop's fables, right? Most of you have probably heard of Aesop's fables. You probably know one or two of them. You probably know maybe the tortoise and the hare is the most popular one. Maybe you know about the crow and the pitcher. Aesop's fables, very simply, 
are stories that have been passed down generationally from a lot of different cultures, and they all kind of contain one primary moral or one primary uh, nugget of wisdom. Uh, and they do it through story form. And so the moral of the tortoise and the hare is slow and steady wins the race, race okay? Uh, there's the, kind of these morals. There's an Aesop's fable you probably haven't heard of, but it's called The Farmer and His Sons. Uh, and it goes something like this. There was a farmer who lived his whole life working his fields, and he's getting close to death's door, and he's about to die. And he realizes, hey, I want to pass this down to my sons, but there's a problem. My sons aren't interested in the work. Um, and so he brings them together, and he tells them, hey, there is buried treasure in the, in the plot of land that we own. And for my whole life, I've worked trying to find that treasure I've dug, and if it wasn't there, I'd just till the land, I'd plant seeds, and move on, and I'd dig and move on. And so all the sons, instead of selling the land, they decide, hey, we're going to find this buried treasure. And so they work so hard. They put all of their passion, all their energy to finding this buried treasure, uh, and they're digging, and they're planting the seeds, they're working the fields so they can pay their mortgage, they can have a living. It comes to the harvest time of that year after their father died. And they have the largest farm in the community. They have the most crops of anyone. And they have the largest return on investment for their farm. And the moral of the story goes, all the sons looked at each other and understood that the treasure that their father was talking about was the work itself. The work itself was meaningful and had importance. Uh, and that is what our text is going to show us today. That no matter what work you do, it has meaning and significance. Uh, but unlike the farmer, God doesn't trick us into working. He tells us why work is meaningful and how to do meaningful work. And so with that, let's go ahead and jump into our text for today. Let's start in Colossians 3.22. We're going to be in Colossians 3.22 through Colossians 4.1. So the text starts off by saying, Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Okay, let's stop right there. Uh, I'm guessing some of you right now are thinking in your minds, I thought this was a sermon on work. Shouldn't the word slaves be employees? And shouldn't the word human masters be managers or supervisors? Um, yes, let me address this, right? The Bible is not a modern book. The Bible is an ancient book, and it's been written over thousands and thousands of years. And something we can't do as modern readers is approach the Bible with our modern lens of what life is like for us right now and then read the Bible through that lens. Sometimes we need to take a step back and dive a little deeper into what, these, what contextually this means. And so really quickly, I want to do that. This is not the main part of the sermon, but I do need to address this. I want to take five minutes to give a quick overview of slavery and the idea of a bondservant in the Bible. Okay, So stay with me. The word slave being used in this verse uh, is actually the word doulos, uh, which can be better translated as bondservant. Um, and so this is not the same as what we call American shadow slavery. Uh, God always, I think there's a big misconception, but God always condemned what we, what we call American slavery. Because in the Old Testament law, uh, what was called human stealing or man stealing was actually a capital crime. And so if you took someone against their will, you were to be put to death. And it literally says if you take someone to work for you or if you take someone to sell for your own personal gain, you should receive capital punishment. And so according to the Bible, God has always be, been against what we call American chattel slavery. God hates people being taken against their will and treated as less than. And while certain people did misuse the Bible to justify slavery, the Old Testament laws were always against this form of slavery. And it was these exact verses in the Old Testament that fueled the faith-based, Christ-centered abolition movement in the West. But in the Old Testament, the reason why this word, do loss, is still in the scriptures is because there was what we call willing servanthood or maybe indentured servitude. And this is when someone had a debt that they couldn't pay back, and so they had to pay it off with work in the legal system. And so this is similar to forgetting your wallet 
uh, when you're eating dinner at a fine dining restaurant and you have to like, wash the dishes in order to pay for your meal, except for on a way larger scale, like thousands and thousands of dollars. But you have to work off uh, your debt. Uh, and in this form of slavery and servitude, I do want to say, like, you were not free. Like, you were legally required to stay and to pay off your debt. And so in this, there was a power dynamic that could go bad. There was someone who had the right over this person to work off the debt. And oftentimes in ancient civilizations, ancient cultures, indentured slaves were mistreated, poorly treated. They were second-class citizens with no rights. Um, and they were uh, not in the best situation socially. But not in Israel. And even in the Old Testament, in these ancient cultures, God cared about the person who was in debt. Uh, he had a heart for those people. And so the Torah in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, there's all these laws for how you should treat indentured servants. You were not to physically harm them. You were to take care of their daily needs, provide them housing, provide them food. And then lastly, when, they, like, when the, the terms of their agreement came up and you're supposed to free them, you're supposed to free them with provisions. Like you're supposed to send them with provisions so that way they're not just free but with nothing to take care of them. And God cared so much about bond servants that he even instituted a holiday that every 50 years, if you were a slave, you were freed. This was called the year of Jubilee. And so if you owed a debt, no matter how much you owed, the year of Jubilee, you were freed, they celebrated it, and you were freed and sent with provisions. And so we can see God has a heart for freedom and for people being treated well. And we know this even more because then Jesus comes to earth, and Jesus, as God on earth, revealing the heart of God, preached that God's kingdom would be a setting of the captives free. That freedom is a primary message of Jesus' gospel. And so spiritually speaking, all of us, we were enslaved, is the language the Bible uses, that we, were, we had a debt we could not pay. And Jesus, through his work, pays our debt and frees us from captivity or bondage. God's kingdom is more than just spiritual. It changes our hearts we, when, we, when we understand the spiritual reality. And then changed hearts lead to changed lives, which lead to changed societies. And the early church took this gospel very seriously. I want to actually mention, in this very church, remember, Colossians is a letter that's written to an actual church, an actual group of people. In this very church, there was a master named Philemon. Uh, and he has a slave called Onesimus. And Onesimus runs away. And when he's running away, he meets Paul, and he becomes a follower of Jesus. And so Paul, we know this, writes a book, a letter called Philemon, and he has Onesimus, the runaway slave, bring it back himself to his master who he ran away from. And the whole point of the book is Paul telling Philemon, uh, hey, do the right thing. You should free Onesimus, so that way he, he's already your equal. You should free him so that way he can serve Jesus with me unhindered. And we know from church history, Philemon did free Onesimus. And that experience or that story is not a unique example. Over and over again in the early church, they took the gospel seriously. Uh, and they were a gospel that was preached to slaves. And so the Christians started a quiet revolution in Rome. Rome had laws where you could free your slaves. And so the Christians started preaching to slaves, hey, you're equal with us. In our, in our community, you're equal. You have the same dignity, value, and worth as everyone else. Uh, and you're welcome here into our communities. And then Christians who were masters or who did own indentured slaves were using the legal system and they would free them. And this is well documented. We see over and over again that where God's heart goes, there is freedom and there is people treating each other in light of the love of Jesus Christ and the gospel. And that is a good thing to celebrate. But with all that being said, with all that background about slavery and bond servanthood, we still have to be honest about human beings. There is still hierarchy, okay? Humans, we've always arranged ourselves into these systems and organizations in order to complete tasks together. So in the ancient world, they used the bond servant system to have work. Now, in modern 21st century America, we have the C-suite level, like the CEOs and the CFOs, 
And then we have director level, and then we have manager level, and then we have supervisor level, and then we have your team members, and then there's probably three levels for your team members, level one, level two, level three. We love a good hierarchy. We love a good set of ruling class. And so the closest parallel we can take from this early uh, church like book or this bond servant and master relationship that Paul is speaking about here is general employment. Employee and manager, your career, your job, whatever your work is, is going to be the closest we get to this concept of bond servant or master. And so, yes, we need to realize that there is a cultural difference between ancient world and modern world where we're at now. Uh, there is a difference between being a bond servant in debt and there's a difference between being an employee right now in 21st century America. But we also need to realize that there is deeper biblical principles here that speak to all cultures and all people for all times. And this can teach us something about work. This does give us a principle for work. And that principle is this. The principle is that whatever work you do, you are not working for a human master, a boss, a supervisor. You're not even working for yourself. All the work you do, whatever it is, is for God and unto God. Let me say that again. Whatever work you do, you're not actually working for a human boss, a human supervisor, or even yourself. All the work you do is for God and unto God. So this is the Christian perspective on work. Work matters and it's meaningful because it is done unto God. And God made us to work. Think about it, right? God, in the beginning, creates or works for six days, and then he rests. And the language that he uses is that God then creates Adam and Eve in his image to imitate him. And he creates them to work. And so we were always created to work. From the very beginning of the Bible, we were created to work and to work as a form of our worship to God. But we know from history as well that the fall complicates things. Sin and the fall twisted work and creates issues. And so the curse made work harder and harder for us and less enjoyable. And we know that sin affects our heart while we work and we have sin issues when we go into the workplace. And so Paul in this text is going to address some of the ways sin creeps into our work. And ultimately he's gonna show us how authentic faith in Jesus makes our work meaningful and addresses those sin issues. And so let's go ahead and read the rest of the text, okay? Let's read the rest of the text. This is Colossians 3, uh, 22 through 24. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there's no favoritism. Masters, deal with your slaves justly and fairly, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. So I think this text, firstly, I think it shows us three common problems or issues we face in our work on a regular basis. And I'm going to go through those really quickly. Problem one, the first problem we face in our work is people-pleasing. Uh, Paul says th these words, don't work only while being watched as people pleasers. There's another translation that says, uh, don't work for eye service to please men. And so it's this idea of just like putting on a show. Don't, don't just put on a show. And I really don't need to explain this verse at all because everyone in this room has experienced this problem. People pleasing is simply giving off the false appearance of excellence or you're making things seem better than they are, right? It's spinning everything you do, everything you say to just be a little bit better than it actually is. And you're doing it in order to gain favor from people and to receive praise and accolades in order to boost that sense of identity and confidence. And people pleasing affects everything, right? Everyone who's married or everyone who has kids, uh, everyone who has friendships can probably admit, yep, people-pleasing is a part of that. And Paul's saying here, people-pleasing is a part of your work too. It's a temptation in work. The way this can play out might be something like this. Maybe you work hard, but you only work hard around the boss. So you get a pat on the back. 
because he's, he's looking, and so you want to work hard right now so you get the pat on the back. Maybe you call yourself the assistant regional manager when really you're just assistant to the regional manager, and you try to like take a title and make it better than it actually is. Uh, maybe you work hard on the exciting projects or the things you really like, but then the day-to-day -day tasks kind of suffer because you're lackadaisical about them. These are all really common, and they're all things, if we're being honest, we probably all struggle with. Personally, we want that recognition. We want praise. And instead of working or focusing on the work itself, we focus on what people think about our work. And so what ends up happening is the work ends up suffering. Uh, M. Scott Sherman, uh, he, put it, he put people pleasing this way. I thought this was really interesting. This is kind of about the inner feeling you have when you're a people pleaser. He says, if you're a people pleaser, you feel on the inside that one of these days you're going to get caught. You're going to forget, you're going to slip up, and you're going to get exposed. As a people pleaser, you're enslaved to always covering all your bases. You're working hard, but you're working hard to not be exposed. I don't know about you, but that sounds exhausting to me. That sounds like anxiety. That sounds like not enjoying your work. And Paul is calling that out. He's calling out and says that's not a good way to work. So people-pleasing, accolades, recognition, Paul wants you to know it will never be enough. It will never be enough. People-pleasing only ultimately leads to half-hearted work. That's problem one. Problem two. Problem two is apathy. In verse 23, Paul says, whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord. Paul's urge is to do work from the heart. See that underlies phrase, do it from the heart. Uh, this can also be translated, work from your soul. So Paul is telling slaves who are doing menial jobs, when you're doing these menial jobs, work from your soul as something done from the Lord. This is the idea of doing a complete job, a job where you know what to do in your head, you do it with purpose and engagement with your heart, and you do it well with your hands. This is doing a complete job. And so Paul here is addressing a common human tendency to not do that, to grow apathetic or to grow lazy sometimes. And sometimes, if we're being honest, we give in to this temptation. We do things half-hearted or we do them uh, not as our best work or we don't do them as good as we know we can, we know we're capable of. You know, in 2023, a report came out that showed Americans are the least happy they have ever been in recorded history. Um, in 2020, uh, economists called, uh, when everyone was resigning, they called it the Great Resignation, right? when everyone was leaving their job. Uh, economists are now calling 2023 the Great Gloom. Em employees just are not happy at their work, uh, and one of the main results they see happening is they're becoming really apathetic in their work. Everyone's just kind of doing a good enough job. Uh, and this low morale is leading to this general workplace apathy. Um, it can look something like this, right? You're tired at work, and so you're like, okay, well, I'm just going to take a break, and I'm going to scroll through Instagram or watch YouTube videos, and next thing you know, it's been a whole hour. Um, is that, that's probably a pretty common occurrence for us. Um, or maybe it looks like, hey, I have 45 minutes left in this shift, and you're counting down the minutes and kind of twiddling your thumbs and not being pers purposeful with those last 45 minutes. Or maybe you feel unfulfilled in your job. You actually like, I don't feel fulfilled in this. And so you do the minimal amount of work in order to meet your job requirements, um, but you know you're capable of more. And, and really, that's what apathy is. Ap apathy is doing less than you know you're capable of. And apathy and laziness in work essentially come back to being an integrity issue. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, are we going to do our job well, or are we going to do it well enough or good enough. Apathy also leads to half-hearted work. That's problem two. Problem three we see in the text is insignificance. From verse 24 to chapter 4, verse 1, there's a recurring theme from Paul. And the recurring theme is that work done for Jesus will be eternal. Work done for yourself or, or work done without Jesus is insignificant. So look, look at the verses right here, right? Verse 24, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. Verse 25, the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done. 
4 1. Masters, deal with your slaves justly and fairly, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. Why is Paul bringing these things up? Why is he connecting an eternal inheritance, the concept of being paid back in the end, and the idea of heaven into your local workplace? Why is Paul doing this? Well, I think he's doing this because in the ancient world, and even today, even today, we associate significance and meaning with hierarchy. The master has more significance than the slave or the bond servant. The CEO has more meaning and purpose than the janitor. The person working for a nonprofit doing this cool thing has more meaning than someone working a corporate nine to five job. Humans, we naturally believe in our hearts that the lowlier the job or the more unfulfilling a job, the more insignificant it is. And we as humans, we struggle with insignificance. We want to feel like our life matters. We want to feel like we have a unique calling, and if I find that unique calling, I'm going to change the world. That was the millennial, like that's all of us, what we were told when we were young. Like, you can change the world. And that's such a heavy weight on our shoulders. Steve Jobs was literally talking about Apple employees. And he made the statement, do you want to know why Apple employees work 18 hours a day? You want to know why they do that? They do that because we employ people or we attract people who want to make a dent in the universe. That is a huge weight on every single human's shoulders that when you think of the size of the world and the size of the universe, that I need to make my mark. But yet we buy into that. We buy into this idea that we need to have a significant job to make a significant mark in this world. And that our job is the primary way we change the world. And social media only makes this work, right? Because we see everyone putting on an image of their wealth, their cool job, and their significance, and you see it 24-7, and you end up comparing your significance to theirs. And you end up feeling disheartened, and that my work's not good enough, my work's not fulfilling, and then it leads to half-hearted work. So that's problem number three. And so what's the solution to these problems? How do we fight people-pleasing, apathy, and insignificance in the workplace? Well, Paul gives us the solution in the text, and you've probably already picked up on it. But Paul gives us a Christian work ethic. And the ethic goes something like this. Meaningful work is done for Jesus, it's done like Jesus, and it's done because of Jesus. Let me say that again. Meaningful work is done for Jesus, it's done like Jesus, and it's done because of Jesus. So let's look at the first one. Meaningful work is is done for Jesus. You know, some people in the world believe that the answer to people pleasing is to lean into it. That if you have haters, we'll prove the haters wrong. And the other side of people pleasing is, hey, if you are a people pleaser, lean into that and chase the accolades, chase the performance, chase the praise you get from your manager. Use both of these in order to fuel yourself to become a better worker. Both of those options will exhaust you. Because here's the deal, you're going to be put into a cycle where sometimes you're going to feel really, really good. And other times when you make mistakes and mess up, you're going to feel really, really bad if you get into that cycle. God, on the other hand, says, no, no, no. Meaningful work is done for Jesus. You have, you have a, a different boss. So don't work for people's approval. Don't work for your boss, your manager's approval. Don't work to get pleasure from your personal success. Rather, work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. And so when you work, realize, hey, Jesus, as God, he sees me. He sees my work. He sees the motives of my heart. And he cares about that. He wants me to do a good job for him. And so God, Jesus, is is the creator of the universe. And he's our Savior and Lord, okay? And so he wants us, he created us to play our part in this world, to bring human flourishing, whatever that is. And so Paul wants us to see Jesus as our true employer or our true master, so to say. And by doing this, what Paul wants us to do is he wants to realize that work is worship. 
You can't separate sacred things and secular things with Jesus. Jesus as your true employee or your true master means that everything I do in my work is under his dominion. Okay, so I bring Jesus into my workplace because my work is worship. And this has been a consistent theme in all of Paul's writings. Earlier in this chapter, what did Paul say? Whatever you do in word or deed, do all to God's glory. And then what does he say in 1 Corinthians 10? Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Over and over again we see in Scripture that there's no divide with Jesus. That there's no divide in the kingdom. Jesus wants all of us, and that means our work. He is our true master. And so work is supposed to be done as worship. It's supposed to be done for Jesus. Secondly, we see meaningful work is done like Jesus. So some people believe that the answer to apathy, so to speak, uh, is, hey, just keep doing what you're doing. You know, if you're doing the minimal job and your boss is okay with it and you're getting paid and you're meeting the job requirements, just keep doing that. You know, if you're getting away, working less than you know, like, just do that. On the other hand, some people will say, hey, you need, if your job's not fulfilling and you're apathetic about it, you should change jobs and go find another job to be more fulfilled. But both of these solutions are just short-term fixes, right? One of them doesn't address the core issue of, of working hard and working with excellence, and the other one might relieve, you, relieve that feeling of in fulfillment for a, a couple of months, maybe a year, but those feelings will come back. It just creates the cycle again. And so what does Paul do? Well, to break out of that cycle, work like Jesus. Bring Jesus' character into your work. God says that meaningful work is done like Jesus. And so that means whatever your job is, the call is to have integrity while you work and to pursue excellence. And so if your work is done for Jesus and is part of your worship, then we should be doing our best. We should be trying hard. And so that means whatever job we have, we should be good at it as a part of our Christian witness. We should be good electricians. We should be good janitors. We should be good healthcare workers. We should be good baristas, good teachers, good engineers, and good lawyers. They say that last one is not possible, but with Jesus, anything is possible, okay? We can be good at the work that we are doing through the power of Jesus. And so working like Jesus means we take Christ's character and we import it into whatever work we are doing. It means we are honest and we are truth tellers. It means we are just and fair and don't show favoritism. It means that we are engaged workers. It means that we are patient with our co-workers. We are self-controlled. We are kind. We are faithful. And we endure. We take the character of Christ and we import it into our work. And we work like Jesus. We work like Jesus. And then lastly, the last one, meaningful work is done because of Jesus. This is about the heart. You know, some people believe the reason we work is to have meaning or significance. That your work is the primary identity you have in this life. And that the way you get value is by climbing up that ladder. Climbing up that corporate ladder and getting to the C-suite. It's by starting a successful side hustle that makes you a lot of money. Or maybe even finding a job that makes you feel alive on the inside. You know, wanting those things is not bad. Wanting to grow, wanting to be successful, or to have a job that is fulfilling, those are all great. But those things cannot be your primary identity. Your job will never be enough to carry that burden. It will never be enough. And so God tells us that meaningful work is done because of Jesus. The reason work is meaningful is not because the work gives us meaning, significance, and purpose. Jesus, through his gospel, gives us an identity that is unshakable. And so Jesus gives us meaning, significance, and purpose. And when we experience that, when we have faith in Jesus, we have authentic faith in him, we then bring that meaning and significance into our work. And that's the heart motive behind our work. And so this teaches us that any worker of any job has meaning and significance if they have faith in Jesus. And it's when you understand that truth, you will work for Jesus and you will work like Jesus. And the promise that Paul gave us in the text is that if you do that, if you work because of Jesus as your motivation of your heart, 
you will have an eternal inheritance. You will be building up an eternal treasure. You'll be helping build God's kingdom here on earth if you do that. And so to summarize, meaningful work is done for Jesus. It's done like Jesus. And lastly, meaningful work is done because of Jesus. And so that means if you are a Starbucks barista working at Starbucks, if you're doing it for Jesus, like Jesus, because of Jesus, Jesus sees that, you matter, and it's, be, it's building up his kingdom. It also means on the flip side, if you are a Starbucks master, so to say, a, a manager, or even the CEO, and if you don't work for Jesus, like Jesus, because of Jesus, your work has no significance. It will fade away with time. The text reminds us, it tells us that there is no favoritism with God. Every person's work matters, and every person's work can have an eternal weight of glory if it's done with faith in Jesus. A job that is not fulfilling can become fulfilling with Jesus. A job with perceived little significance can become eternally significant with Jesus. Jesus really wants to transform how we work. And so whether you are a team member, whether you are the CEO, whether you are your own boss, whether you are a stay-at-home mom, Jesus wants every single one of us, and he wants us to work with him in our lives. Now some of us, some of you may have heard this type of message before. I'm probably not saying anything new. And maybe you believe all the things I've said, but you still have a certain feeling when you go to work. You still feel not good enough. You still feel trapped by your work. You still feel like you need to please people in order to get ahead. And so there's a tension we face between what we know to be true and how we feel. And I can tell you, I've experienced this before. I've experienced this disconnect. You know, before I came to work at the church, I worked for a medical software startup. And so we were doing important work. I was doing something that had value uh, for the medical community. You know, as the company grew, I was getting paid more and more. I owned a percentage of the company for helping start it and build it. Um, Things were going well. And at the same time, I was attending gatherings here. I was leading a small group. And I knew in my mind that my primary identity was in Jesus. And yet for the last, like, three years of my work there, every every day I went in, I just was a people pleaser. Uh, I, I really cared what my boss thought, but at the same time, I was also apathetic, and I also felt insignificant. I'm like, why am I even doing this job? I'm answering support calls sometime and getting yelled at people over the phone, and I just like, do not like what I'm doing at all. And I had this discontentment in my soul. And then I got a, I got a job offer, <laughs> a job offer from Resurrection Church. And my first thought or my first feeling was relief. I felt relieved. And the reason I felt relief was I was like, now I'm going to be doing work that has significance. Now I'm going to be doing something that matters. Um, And it did, it did relieve that for a while. I'll be honest, like it it felt better. Um, But even with a job I loved, and I still, I love this job. I love that I get the opportunity to work here and be a pastor here. I love it. I still occasionally will experience feelings of insignificance apathy, and people-pleasing. And why is that? And the answer for me is simple. It's, it's a heart issue. It's always a heart issue, no matter what your work is. If we functionally look to our work as our primary identity, you will always end up having those feelings of people-pleasing, apathy, and insignificance. Which, as a pastor, is especially trippy because you're naturally working <laughs> towards things that you believe are eternal. But me personally, like, I wanted my work to matter. I still want my work to matter so much that I take my eyes off what really matters. And what really matters has always been and will always be Jesus Christ and my relationship with him. That is the primary thing I need to focus on. And so the more I spend time with Jesus, the more I bring him into my work, the more I talk with God through the power of his Holy Spirit, the more I naturally talk about him, the more I invite the Holy Spirit into my work, the, that's the more energized and the more significant it feels. 
because I'm giving it to Jesus and he's making it holy. I can really say that. It's, it's been the only thing that has ever made me feel like my work has significance. It's just pursuing my personal relationship with Jesus. And that's the message of the scripture, is that if we in faith pursue a relationship with God and pursue a relationship with the son, Jesus, he will take whatever work you are doing, he will take whatever it is, and he will use it for his kingdom and for his good. God takes whatever work we bring and he makes it holy. Because ultimately work is not about me, work is about him. It's about giving him glory. And so God uses everything. Think about it. God created Adam and Eve as gardeners, landscapers, and farmers. God used Noah as a, build, as a builder, a construction worker. God used priests. But then he also used midwives. He used shepherds. He used servants. He used kings. He used cupbearers. He used all these different people for his glory. He used all these different types of people to bring about his kingdom and to bring the Messiah into the world. And then Jesus came as the Messiah. He came in a lowly stable to normal, everyday people, blue-collar people. He came to this earth, and he worked as an anonymous craftsman and carpenter for the first 30 years of his life. And then the Bible tells us that he was made fun of for that. Like he was mocked for working a tradesman job and then being a rabbi. And then Jesus starts his ministry, and he starts off by saying, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. Another way of saying that, I didn't come to be worked for, I came to work. And we know from the gospel, Jesus took the lowly job of a slave by washing his own disciples' feet and said, this is not beneath me, I will serve you. And then he asked us as his disciples, will you do the same? And then Jesus did the work we could never do. Jesus died the death that we deserve. He paid the debt we can never work off, and he rose to completely free us. And now Jesus is in heaven, working now as the master of all, and he sends his spirit to empower us in everything we do, including our daily work. And we get to serve him with joy, not as slaves, but as his friends and as his children. And so if you accept God's invitation to work for Jesus, like Jesus, because of Jesus in this life, you will receive an eternal inheritance and you will be part of an eternal kingdom where you will worship God with your work perfectly for all eternity with no feelings of apathy or insignificance, with no trace of people pleasing. You will only experience passion, significance, and delight as you work before the presence of God Almighty. And so here is the heart of the matter. Your work is meaningful. Whatever you do, no matter what it is, it has eternal significance and meaning if you do it for Jesus, like Jesus, because of Jesus. I think one of our greatest temptations in our current cultural moment is to put our identity and our significance in our work. I've been saying it throughout this whole sermon. Our work is our primary thing that we look to uh, for our identity. And some of the ways this can play out is a stay-at-home mom asking, Am I enough? Does raising this whiny child, changing these dirty day diapers, or scraping dried ketchup and Chick-fil-A from underneath the kitchen table matter? Yes, it does. It does matter if you do it for Jesus, like Jesus, because of Jesus. When you're fired because of a financial crisis or something out of your control, and you immediately think the questions, what was my work for? Why did I try so hard? Why did I give my, my time to that company? You never have to wonder that when you're serving King Jesus and working for him. If you work at any company, if you do it for Jesus, like Jesus, because of Jesus, you're trying hard, you're giving your time to that work, matters because he sees it. And it will matter for all of eternity. And so your work is meaningful. It, it, it is meaningful. It has purpose. But it's not meaningful in and of itself. It's meaningful because when you have a relationship with Jesus and you put your faith in him, you bring that meaning and purpose into your work. And that's what gives it meaning and significance. Let's pray, church. Father God, we come before you and we thank you and we praise you as the creator of all things. God, you worked, you created, you, you worked and then rested. 
And then you invite us to work with you and for you. You take all of the daily tasks, you take all of our daily activities and work that sometimes seem humdrum and boring, God, and you say, I see you, and that matters. That has purpose, that has significance. And so, God, we just pray right now that everyone in here, whatever work they do, whether they're a student, whether they're a stay-at-home mom, whether they work a corporate job, are self-employed, or own their own business, God, whatever work we do, God, may we offer it as a living sacrifice to you. May we live our whole life, which includes our work, living our life before your face, God. And that way we, we would realize that any little task we do has an eternal weight of glory if we do it for your glory. So Holy Spirit, would you excite us, would you encourage us to do good work and to do work for Jesus, like Jesus, because of the Son, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.